What is going on everyone? So in this week's video, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna take a look at a 709.6 megapixel scan of one of my sheets of film. This is a photo I shot on my fall trip. And for those of you that are not familiar with the hybrid film digital workflow, uh, this photo is originally captured on eight by 10 inch slide film. So the film is about that big. And you can essentially scan it at whatever resolution you want, just so long as the proper decisions were made when the photo itself was taken, so everything is as sharp as it can be. Uh, when I scan photos at home, I have an Epson flatbed scanner. It does a pretty good job. I can realistically scan it to be several hundred megapixels. It'll look very good, but it won't be as good as a drum scan. Now, I don't have a drum scanner, but a really good photographer friend of mine does. His name is Michael Strickland. And uh, he recently bought a drum scanner uh, so that he can scan his own images uh, because that ends up being a very expensive process if you don't own a scanner. So he did a little experiment for me. So this is the actual scan right here. And there's a limitation to how big the file size can be when working with these scanners and how many pixels it can be. But he did a little experiment for me and he actually scanned it, the top half, the bottom half, then merged them together. The result is an insanely huge file. It is 709.6 megapixels. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this file up close. How does it look at 100%? Uh, what can we learn from seeing a file this big? And also, how does my 2010 Mac Pro computer handle such a huge file? It's actually not that bad, but let's take a look at this image. So I've opened the file here in Photoshop and you're gonna see it's gonna look a little bit weird here because first of all, there's two things we're working with. My screen capture is not at 4K like the camera is, but also when you're viewing a file at 3.55% in Photoshop, um, there's gonna be some kind of weird stuff that happens, but we're gonna zoom in 100% to this file pretty soon. Um, but a couple things on this. So this picture was taken with my 150 millimeter wide angle lens, um, and I had to make some decisions when I was taking this photo. Uh, the depth of field on an eight by 10 camera is really, really slim. So this is why you have to do the movements like the front tilt and stuff along this line to give the appearance of a larger depth of field. And typically, if I have vertical subjects in a photo like these trees, you really don't want to use any front tilt because you're not gonna get you know, even sharpness throughout. But in this particular scene, since the foreground is actually pretty darn close to the camera, um, and the most important subjects are really um, all the grasses here, the rocks, the tree, and these lower parts of the trees, I'm not as concerned about the sharpness right up across the top there. Um, and I'd say it's also acceptable if you have it where it's not tack sharp in the foreground. If it's not tack sharp here, it kind of puts the emphasis there. So I made the decision on this photo to use a little bit of front tilt. And I'd say that if I was using a camera other than the Arca Swiss, so this would have been really tricky, um, but the Arca Swiss has a uh, special uh, front tilt, which is geared where you basically focus in the background, you tilt for the foreground and everything looks good. So that actually really helped out in the scene because it was really, really precise. But let's take a look at this image and the image size is 23,790 pixels by 29,828 pixels. So it's a huge file. Uh, it's basically a four gigabyte TIFF file. Uh, at 300 pixels per inch, we're looking at a print size of 79.3 inches by 99.427 inches, which is bigger than I'd ever print anything. But this is kind of more of an experiment of how big can this file be scanned and how does it look at that size? So I have the navigator window here in the lower left corner. And then I will use that so I can kind of move around within the file. So when we zoom into 100%, I can kind of move around in a very orderly way. But if I zoom into 100%, uh, we're kind of right in the middle of the file right here. But let's take a look at the 100% sharpness of this file. Um, so we have all these grasses, we have some of these little plants and flowers and everything. But I will say this is pretty impressive. Uh, we're not being limited by the resolving power of the grain. I mean, we see a little bit of grain there, but it's actually not a lot of grain going on. Um, we're just seeing the details of the grasses, of the leaves and everything else. And this is where it's pretty cool what you can see as far as when you have a really high resolution file. Um, now, in my last video from Zion, I mentioned, well, I revisited this exact scene right here. 
and I mentioned how I found a bird's nest. And so some of you asked, you know, did I see that bird's nest in the actual photo? And the answer is yes, but it's, it's kind of hidden. But if I take my uh, navigator up here, you see the bird's nest right there in the middle, kind of obscured a little bit by these leaves, but you can see some of the materials and stuff that was used to, to make the nest there. And you also see that these leaves are, are pretty darn sharp and there's just a tiny little bit of grain, but in kind of a, a nice way. Now, what I was talking a little bit earlier about how I used a little bit of front tilt, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the realities of when you look at a file this big, there's gonna be some sacrifices that I have to make in order to get the most important area sharp. And we're gonna look at sort of what that actually amounts to. So if I take my window and drag it all the way down to the lower edge, you'll see that we are not very sharp down here. I mean, this will be just fine in print. And also keep in mind that this represents a 100 inch tall print. Um, but if you have a not super tack sharp foreground, that's actually pretty acceptable because it kind of leads you into the frame a little bit. If I work my way up a little bit higher, it gets a little bit sharper, a little bit higher, gets a little bit sharper. You see that once I kind of get to about where this rock is right here, now we're actually gonna be nice and sharp for quite a ways, especially sharp in through here. Um, and so that was one of my objectives is I was able to sacrifice a little bit of the extreme foreground uh, in order to get the most important parts really nice and sharp. So if I zoom back in again to 100% and I take a look at this uh, sort of mid-ground rock right here, you see that we're really, really sharp. We have these leaves in focus here. Um, everything is looking, looking quite nice there. But then if I go beyond that rock to the background, you see we're actually a little bit on the soft side. And that's because the plane of focus is actually skimming a little bit over this guy um, in order to get some of the other stuff. The tree in the background, uh, the lower part of the tree right here is actually pretty darn good. As I work my way up the upper part of the tree, there's a little bit of wind right here, but the upper part of the tree is not as sharp as the lower part of the tree. And it's because I knew that that tree was at the very limit as far as what was gonna be acceptably sharp, but it was important enough to try to get as much of that in there as I could. Uh, let's take a look over here at the, uh, the base of this tree over here on the left side. If we look at this, we are very sharp at the base. We have our grasses, everything there. As we work our way up, um, we're quite good. Really good sharp details in there. As I keep working my way up, we're still pretty darn good. Still pretty darn good. Now we're starting to lose it just a little bit. Now we're actually getting a little bit softer as we work our way up to the point where once you get to the very top, you're not really gonna be as much in focus. And this was kind of by design. So we see that uh, as far as the grassy areas, it starts getting really sharp kind of all the way up in through here. This rock really looks good. The trees all the way up to about here looks good. And you'll see that that's about the same areas where the top of that tree is in the background. And what I haven't shown you yet is the foreground rock. Now, technically, I'm not quite critically sharp on the foreground rock, but that was a decision that I made in order to get all the other stuff in focus. Because I think the foreground is sometimes a little bit more forgivable if we can't quite get everything. You'll see where I made some sacrifices here. So the bottom edge of this rock is looking pretty good. Um, we've got some good sharp detail in through there. So I work my way up, and eh, it's pretty decent. But if I work around more towards the front face of the rock, you'll see that technically I'm actually a little bit out of focus, but this was one of the sacrifices that I made um, so that I'd have acceptable sharpness on this rock. It'll look just fine. But in order to have really good sharpness in some of these grasses and stuff back behind. So I'll say that there is acceptable focus on this rock, but the grasses and then this rock in the background or mid ground I should really say, are even sharper. But I think it's kind of a cool learning experience to see one of the photos at really high resolution, just to kind of see the result of those decisions that are made in the field. And it, either it confirms that the technique I used was good for the scene, or maybe it's something that I can learn from next time around. I'd say in this case, I did pretty well because I was able to get the most important areas in focus. But I want to thank everyone for watching, and we'll see you around next week.